wrapping this thing up, this unveiling series, this seeing Jesus, encountering Jesus in the book of Revelation, understanding the role that these final events play and who, how Jesus is pulling us through it. Next week, you see back in 1621 when it's recounted as, as the first Thanksgiving dinner, what Revelation points out is that the Thanksgiving dinners are not ever going to stop. There will be celebrations of thanksgiving around a supper table in eternity. And so next week in our final study of the book of Revelation, at least in a worship service, we've got the round table starting Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night after the concert. But we are going to do next week, we are going to study those final verses of Revelation and the celebration of supper. We can't, you can't do that without then coming together and actually doing a, a supper. So right after service. Now, there's only one service next week. Don't get, yeah, I know, I know. You've been wait, sleeping until about 10, 10, 15, but that's, that's over. Next week, 9.30 is the study hour and 10.45 is the worship time. After that service, you're all invited over to the, to the academy gym where we will do a campus-wide, congregation-wide meal. Now, there's information in the bulletin you want to follow along with, but it's a Thanksgiving celebration. We're going to conclude the service with a time of Thanksgiving and a communion service moment, all in celebrating the end of the book of Revelation. So, next week. This week, however, I want to, I want to start with this line from Dr. Stavanovich, professor at Andrews University. In his volume, he's written several volumes on the book of Revelation, his volume, Plain Revelation, he says, keep in mind that the purpose of Revelation's prophecies, the, the, the studies that we've been doing, keep in mind, it is not to satisfy your curiosity. It is, in fact, about your future, about the future, but to move us into a readiness for that future. I, I summarized it this way after reading his line. Revelation is not meant to satisfy my curiosity. It's meant to satisfy my eternity. The book Revelation takes us very seriously. We live in solemn times, one author writes. We have got to take the minutes that we have left seriously. And that's why we're going to keep singing that song, Rise and Shine. The late Gene Robertson, motivational speaker, Christian motivational speaker, passed away this last year, a loss. She, uh, she recounts at age, she died at age 77, but at age 69, how her and her husband were invited to go on an eight-day rafting trip down the Colorado River. They thought, no, we're too old for this, but they went to the website, checked it out. In fact, oh, no, it looks like accommodations each night. We'll sleep on some cots. And, uh, you know, there's adequate facilities. Well, she gets on this trip, and she just, in her own humorous way, shares, uh, everything you take in, you have to take out. Everything you produce, you have to take out. And she says, so the adequate facilities were not, in her opinion, very adequate. But she says, listen, they, they said they, that you get to sleep on cots each night of the eight-day trip, but the cots had been done away with years before. They just hadn't updated the website. They, you just slept on a thermorest in these little tents that they provided, about four foot high, two-man tents. And she says, her and her husband, 69 years old, camping along the Colorado River. Five days into this trip, they have not showered or washed. It is, it is muddy. The river is muddy, and it's just been spraying them and splashing them for five days now. They're still three days out from finishing this trip. Five days in, they go to bed in their little two-man tent. And she says, about 3 a.m., about 3 a.m., she, she wakes up to feeling her husband, sweet man that he is, getting a little fresh, just kind of nibbling on her neck. And she, she lays there for a second and thinks, uh, I, I'm not into this. I am five days, no shower, no, we are, we are not clean. I, I, there is no, no. And so she just says, you know, gently. She gently puts up her hand to to push him away, and her hand grabs a lizard. <laughs> and that's not a pet name for her beloved. She says this lizard was about from her finger to her elbow, and it 
was nibbling on her neck. Of course, she throws the lizard, but she's in a tent, so it doesn't go very far. And then she jumps up and screams, which gets her husband up. And so they're both bobbing around in this four-foot-high tent. She said, we look like a popcorn bag in the microwave when it starts popping. And you just got stuff bouncing around. We couldn't find the zipper, but every once in a while, we could feel the lizard's tail kind of slap us in the face. Finally, somebody from the, uh, another tent got over to them. And as they're kind of bobbing around the whole campsite, unzips their tent and out pops the lizard. He's gone. <laughs> she says, you know, when you wake up in the night and you have your point of reference, okay, this is my husband. This, I, I know this. I can, I, I can put two and two together based on my experience, based viewing things through the lenses of my life, I made a conclusion. It was not a correct conclusion. In fact, what I thought was something, something benign or something sweet for my husband was in fact a dragon, a lizard. And wouldn't you know it, the book of Revelation, what Dr. Stavanovich is saying is keep in mind these prophecies are not, just not little cute satisfactions to our curiosity. These are prophecies that are meant to stir our souls to a readiness for the final moments of earth's history and to prepare us for eternity. This is not cute or curiosity. This is eternal that we're dealing with. And so grab your Bibles, Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. You've got a pew Bible in front of you. You're missing your own today. The question emerges, and this is what Dr. Slavonovich is, is alluding to, is that these prophecies, these are cogent, clarion truths that are preparing us for a real end of the world. And we can play along all we want and view things through the lenses of our own experiences. Say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Come on. But you ask Miss Simmons over here at our music department. She will be very clear with you. And every one of these singers know. I would, come on, I was on the front. I was listening to them. Are they off? Are they off? Are they on? She'll tell you. There is, there is anywhere you go in the world, there is one middle C. It is never... The middle C at 256 vibrations per second. It is what it is. And, and you and I can sing whatever note we want and call it middle C, but it doesn't make it any more middle C. It's there's only one. What Revelation is appealing to us to come into is not to filter things through our personal experiences. Because we could be very mistaken, mistaken something like a dragon for something that's harmless. There's only one middle C, and what Revelation is appealing to is that there's only one right, and we must make the decision. And so I appeal to you, you would take this seriously. What is Revelation 16? Revelation 16, known as the last plagues or the seven bowls. What happens? Revelation 16, verse 1, that I heard. A loud voice from the temple. That, where it's coming from is important. We'll come right back to that. Saying to the seven angels. Now there's seven angels. In Revelation 14, we heard about three angels. Now there's seven angels lined up, each one of these with a task. But this task is a difficult task. I'm sure the angels did not relish this opportunity. They, the command was go out with your bowls, your seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Revelation 16 and verse 1. In fact, I'll put it on the screen for you. We'll try to put it on the screen for you. Revelation 16 and verse 1. I heard a loud voice coming from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. What terrible, terrible chore they have. Where did it come from? The voice came from the temple. The context of this instruction was, was coming from the temple. 
What's going on in the temple? If you just back up right into, verse, into chapter 15 and pretend there's no chapter division there, you'll read verse 8 of chapter 15. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Why is that important? Because this is using Old Testament imagery, an Old Testament practice where the priests would intercede, would take the blood of the lamb that was for the sins of the people, of their repentance. It would take them into the temple and intercede on their behalf. But there came a moment when no one could go into the temple. Intercession had ceased. And God's glory filled the temple, accepting it. It was a day of atonement moment. It was the conclusion. They had to be right before God. There was no, no after that that you could come. Uh, sorry, sorry, I missed the deadline here. I've got what Revelation 15, 8 is setting us up to understand is that this is a concluding act. That those of us on this planet, on earth, have made our eternal decision for right or for wrong. For heaven or for hell. So when these angels go out, they are pouring the wrath of God on a planet that has already decided. There is no more decisions. We'll find out more about that. But let me, let me get some good news here. Also employed in Revelation in these plagues is the imagery from the Exodus. The Israelites were captive in Egypt, and God says, I need, I, I need to take my people out. Well, Pharaoh and his host said, not on our watch. So God said, well, just, just hold the phone. And ten plagues later, those Israelites are marching out with loot from the Egyptians. We want you to go get out of here. What happens in this, in this picture that is created in Revelation is that these plagues are poured out on the planet. A planet that is hating on God's people, but holding on to them. Saying, you are the cause of all of our problems. But by the end, they are saying, we just wish you would get off our planet. Get out of here. In fact, the plagues set up the possibility for the exodus. The scope is worldwide, not just in impact, but in intensity. There were seven trumpets that each delivered a signal warning that God's judgments were coming. But these seven bowls, these seven last plagues are poured out in one of those trumpets. During one period, the seventh trumpet, they're poured out in quick succession. The first four. The first four focus on the world, the general population of the rebellious. Pick up verse 2. The first angel went and poured out the bowl that it was in his hand. I'm thinking, you know, just picture that cereal bowl out on the land. And ugly, festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his, his image. Last week, rewind. Last week, we studied about this mark and this image and the work of the beast, the sea and the land beast and what they represent in this end time scenario. What happens here? The wrath is poured out. But where? Yes, on the earth, but on whom? On those who have chosen to be rebellious against God. The fifth the first, first four plagues are poured out on the general population of the rebellious. The fifth and the sixth then focus intentionally and specifically on the leadership of what, the, what Revelation begins to call the Babylon. This, this movement that's in apostasy against God. She once was faithful. She once was birthed out of the op apostolic movement, the disciples of Jesus, taking what they had heard from Jesus. They, they started a church, and that was the church. And then, and then she became married to the pagan ideas and culture and entertainment and education of the world. And then it shifted. She became in rebellion against God. She didn't like his, his ideas anymore. But here's, here's the good news on this. 
The plagues are poured out on the unfaithful. Just like in the Exodus story, the first three plagues were poured out on everyone. But the last seven plagues were only poured out on the Egyptians. And so Revelation snatches that and says, yep, this is exactly what we understand will happen at the end. There will be plagues that are poured out, but not on everyone. Not on everyone. They will be poured out on those who are in rebellion. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and the ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and, and worshipped its, its image. These plagues were in direct contradiction, or in direct contrast, we should say, with what the people had done in rebellion. You see, the people who accepted the mark or of the beast, they accepted it. Why? The Bible says they accepted it because no man could buy or sell without it. So for physical provision, they accepted the mark of the beast. And now they are physically suffering the very thing that they thought they would avoid by being rebellious. No, oh, this is the way. We, we got to go with the world on this one. This is the only way we'll survive. And God says, I want you to know. I want you to know. Look at who doesn't have the boils. What's the purpose of the plagues? Three purposes, if you're a note taker. Three purposes. One is that they're redemptive. They are meant to defeat the enemies and weaken the enemies of God to deliver his people. The Egyptian scenario. We're not letting you go. And then by the end, you got to get out of here. We don't want to be close to you. Get out of here. Go to the promised land. What God is doing is he's using these plagues to diminish the powerful hold the world has and to separate those who are in rebellion and those who are faithful. These are redemptive. Secondly, they're punitive. They only fall on those who choose not to follow the lamb. And thirdly, they're decisive. They fall on rebellious humanity, those who think they have their own ideas and their own ways, and they clarify. Dr. Tonstead from California says it's an unmasking experience. You see the decision for what it was. And what throughout the seven plagues, throughout chapter 16, multiple times is repeated that they repented not of their sins. In other words, these plagues... Poured out, God's wrath poured out, prove that they have made their eternal decision and they aren't willing to change it, even when they're suffering. It's this picture that God is finishing the work and there's no one there saying, if I only had another chance, if I only understood how bad my decisions were. There won't be any more decisions. We live in solemn moments. Now, Revelation is mostly chronological. It moves forward towards a chronological destination, the second coming of Jesus, the end of the world's history as we know it, eternity, the beginning of our eternity. It's moving towards that. But what John does is he can't say everything at once, so he, he says something and then he kind of revisits. Well, what he does in chapter 16 is unpack these seven plagues and then he introduces, wait a minute, I want you to know about this Babylon because she is playing a significant role. She's the one that in the fifth and the sixth plagues gets the, intentionally gets the plague poured out on him. So there's something, something unique about this and we jump to chapter 18. Just flip the page in your Bible, you'll be at 18. After this, I saw another angel. After what? After chapter 17 is what he's unpacking about Babylon. He's described Babylon to us. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had a great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted. This is a shout from this angel, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Or in the King James, as we put on the screen, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It's a repetition. It's that linguistic tool that this is important and this is true and this is absolute. Babylon is fallen. 
She had become a dwelling place of demons. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Fornicate, it uses provocative language to describe who once was espoused to God, who once was in a relationship with God, has now become a, a player accepting from multiple angles or multiple identities. Why Babylon, though? Why, why, it's, why this term Babylon? Well, we, we can go back to the Old Testament imagery, the, the narrative of Babel, a confusion of languages. That gives us a little clue at what Revelation is trying to unpack in the book of Revelation. Why is it referring to this apostate movement as, as Babylon? Why? Because it's a confusion. Not only that narrative, but the narrative in the book of Daniel talks about a Babylon who comes and tries to reculture God's people. Nebuchadnezzar, a genius leader, takes the captives and recultures them so that they go back into their own people groups and impact their circles. What is Babylon then? In the story of Daniel, it's a pagan, a religious pagan entity that opposes God. In the story of the, of the tower, it's a confusion, Babel. Babylon, in short, is unfaithfulness. I'll put it on the screen for you. It's unfaithfulness. When you can know better. And that was Daniel's appeal to, the, to Babylon. You do know better. I've, I've shared with you. You've seen the signs through my life. You know better. Listen to this next line. It is an apostate mentality or system. Oh, I have people all the time. Well, who is Babylon? Just tell us who Babylon is. It wouldn't it be nice if there was just a, a who, like a, like a system, like an organization or a denomination. Wouldn't that be just fancy if we could just say, stay away from the Baptist. Poor Baptist, just picking them out of the hat. Stay away from the Baptist. They're Babylon. If you happen to be Baptist, my apologies. But that's not how it is, and that's not who it is. It is a system of belief, of unfaithfulness to God, and it is a mentality because the mentality is, or, or, or the thinking is, well, as long as I'm not part of that group or part of that system or part of that denomination, whatever the de denomination that you want to point out would be, then I'm okay. But the truth is, is that you can have a mentality that is Babylonian while you sit in any denomination at any school. You can be Babylonian and be worshiping here. Because it's a mentality. What's the mentality? Keep reading. It is demonstrated in spiritual pluralism. What's good for you? Good for me? Hey, listen. God's not really that. Come on. My preference, my tradition is just as valid as God's word. The way I see things, the way I feel, the way I experience, it is just as good. That is a Babylonian mentality. Why? Because the Babylonians said, hey, you pick your God. You can have any God. Just make sure you have some. They didn't care that Jews had a God. They added that God to their gods. It's a Babylonian mentality. But it's ultimately unfaithfulness to the one true God. And his covenant law. So what happens to this, this Babylonian system, this mentality? Revelation 18 and verse 4, my favorite verse in this chapter. Then I heard another voice from heaven. Just pause right there and just catch the, catch the significance here. In verse 1, he, see, he hears another or he saw another angel, and then he hears with great authority and a mighty voice, the angel shouted, shouted the warning. What did you know? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And then John says, but, but wait, 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 wait. Now I hear another voice. This voice doesn't shout. In my imagination, 
as I read it. This voice may be even choked up a little bit. It's a soft, passionate appeal. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her. Tear choked. Come out of her, my people. My people. Won't you decide faithfulness? Won't you decide To be in this covenant relationship. Won't you decide full surrender? Won't you decide, no matter the cost, to be obedient to the plan and the covenant relationship? Won't you be faithful to me? I don't know for certainty that this is the voice of Jesus, but it sure makes sense. Come out of her, my people. I know what's coming next, so that you will not share in her sins And what do her sins bring that you will receive not of her plagues? And now we know. Revelation 18 and verse 4 happens before in the timeline, Revelation 16. Why? Because Babylon receives the plagues in Revelation 16. And so John is just trying to put as much information as fast as he can. And he gives us Revelation 16. But he says, really, Revelation 18 and verse 4, this appeal to make your decision for faithfulness to God comes before Revelation chapter 16. And you know what Revelation 18 and verse 4 is? It is the last appeal in Scripture. You don't have another appeal after Revelation 18 and verse 4. Why? Because after Revelation 18 18 and verse 4, every decision is made and the plagues fall. No one changes their mind. They repented not of their sins. Your destiny has been set. I got up early this morning in the darkness of the morning. Looking out the west view from our living room into the night sky. It was softened a bit with the light of the moon. But there is one of the best seasons for for looking at Orion. And I'm staring up into the night sky into the constellation Orion. For me, it's personal. It's It's just like a window to heaven. I said, God, what do you what do you need from us on this planet? He said, I need you to take these moments seriously. I was up early. I get up early on on Saturday mornings. But I was up a little early this morning. I got a call from the police department I serve as a chaplain for of a family at 2 a.m. who woke up to their house on fire. They went to bed last night. Hours later, they thought they had the night, everything's good, nothing's wrong. But at 2 a.m. here in Loveland, a family woke up and realized that they were out of time. The appeal of Revelation 18 verse 4 is you're out of time. You're out of time, please. And that's why you can hear the choked up voice of Jesus Coming from heaven saying, please, come out of her. Come out of the system. Come out of the mentality. Come out of this idea that you get to call it what it is. Church tradition. We worship the way we worship because of church. Because my parents did. What does God say? Come out of her. My people. This is the last invitation forever. What are you and I going to do about it? 65 and a half books have passed. 783,137 words in Scripture from Genesis to now Revelation 18 verse 4. And we get to this point. And this is the last time. You, if, you're, if you've been here at Campion, you know that we use this tagline, each one reach one, because we believe Revelation 18 verse 4 hasn't happened yet. We believe we can still reach out to our neighbors and share Jesus with everyone around us. But when Revelation 18 and verse 4 happens, there will be no more re- one, each one reach one. The, the appeal will be over. There's no more call. 
There's no more reach out to your neighbors and let them know the love of Jesus. Eternities are determined. Heaven has been won and hell now waits. You see, John isn't alone. This, this come out of Babylon is throughout Scripture. It was birthed in the Old Testament. God, God didn't just get to the end and say, hey, come out now. In, in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah speaks up, uh, chapter 48, verse 20. And he says, leave Babylon. Flee from the Babylonians. Get as far away from that as you can. Quit reading their books. Quit watching their YouTubes. Quit watching their movies. Stop their music. Separate yourself from this idea that I can do whatever I want and I'm okay. Flee the Babylonians. Oh, Jeremiah, you know, you say, well, that's kind of strong. Wait, wait till you get to Jeremiah, chapter 51 and verse 45. Oh, Jeremiah says, come out of her, which is where John gets his line. And then Jeremiah says, run for your lives. Why? Because your life depends on the separation of the mentality and the system of the Babylonians. Your life, your eternal life, depends on your decision to be faithful to God. I stood there in the morning, darkness, looking up at Orion. And I prayed one prayer. Oh God, would it be that not one person within the sound of my voice today will be lost. Please, God. Can you pull off a miracle and save us all? It's the last invitation Jesus will ever make. This last summer, it was in August, we were traveling here to church for a worship service. And we passed by a dairy on our way here, and typically we see the the dust, the yellow dust stirred up in the barn from the tractors getting the feed ready for the cows. And this morning we saw that yellow cloud and didn't think twice until we kind of just passed it, thought, wait a minute, wait, that wasn't coming from the right spot. It, you, it's usually in the barn, but so we doubled back and went into the dairy, drove up into the farm and realized that the, the, the yellow cloud was not coming from the barn, it was coming from the house and the house it wasn't dust, it was smoke, and that house was on fire. We pulled around the front, calling 911. Man come rushing out of the house, carrying some personal belongings, dumping them over the porch, going back in for more. Called 911, they said, we've got help coming on the way. Now, just freeze that story for a moment. And imagine another scenario. You know how it is. When you break the law, even if it's just a little bit, you're, you know, your tail lights out, you've got an expired driver's license, uh, your tags are expired, so, something, just something is off on your car. And, and uh, you see a policeman, and you're sure, you are sure that he, he or she has just been called to deal with you, and they're just looking at you. You know they're coming after you. Uh, just imagine that feeling, because most of us haven't been in this scenario. Uh, let's say you're, you've broken the law, you have done a rebellious act. And you hear the sirens coming. Most run from the sirens. Those sirens are not reassuring. They're not hope. They're, they're warnings of coming disaster. When you're unfaithful, when you've broken the law, sirens are not your friend. Not because the sirens are any different, but because of what's on the inside of you. And when we talk about the seven last plagues, sometimes we, we get scared like, oh, this is going to be, oh, oh, no, look what's going to happen. But God says, you're, you should only be worried if you're unfaithful. Standing outside the farmhouse, I had nothing to be concerned about. And so when we started to hear those sirens at first, just faintly, you almost had to hold your breath to hear them coming, but soon, soon arrived a sheriff's deputy and a state trooper and another deputy and, and then fire trucks from three different districts. And those sirens 
didn't scare us. They were signals of hope. They were the reassurance that our, our help was on the way. And the louder they got, the closer they got, the better the news was. But in your heart, if you are unfaithful to God, if you are living in disobedience, then those sirens are scary. But not so if you are right before God. If your heart is surrendered and you are living in obedience, then those sirens are hope and help. And that's what the seven last plagues are meant to be for those who have come out of Babylon. God says these plagues are just signals that your exodus, your journey to the promised land is just about to happen. So come out of her, Jesus pleads. Where should we go? Where should we go? Do you know what the seventh plague is? What is so terrible for those who are unfaithful? Listen to the seventh plague. Your Bibles to verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne. There's only one who sits on the throne saying, it is done. The very same words that this same God said in John chapter 19 and verse 30 when he stretched out his arms on a cross and he said, it is finished. Now on the throne of the universe, Jesus cries out again, it is done. I did it for you. I did it for you. It's Veterans Weekend yesterday. They say when a war ends, there's still the ramifications, the impact that it has on those who fought in the war. You see, Revelation 18 ends with the demise, the downfall, the description of Babylon's fall. It's ruined forever. It's done. But Revelation 19 picks up with the general of heaven riding on a white horse followed by the Calvary of the universe. Here comes heaven's armies to rescue the POWs, the prisoners of war. They say on, on wars that end here on this planet, soldiers have a high percentage of depression. 67% of the soldiers after a war ends struggle with depression. 72 struggle with anxiety. 42% struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder, commonly known as PTSD. But in this war of all wars, this great controversy that has been waging and raging for thousands of years. Jesus says, I'll take the consequences. The war will end and you won't have to deal with it. But forever, he will bear the scars of the battle for your life. We won't. Because of his stripes, will be completely healed. So where should you go? Run to Jesus. What does it mean for you? Jesus, what does faithfulness mean for me? What about the Sabbath commandment? What about my choices for entertainment? What about, go ask Jesus. What does faithfulness mean for you? What is God calling for you? I want to invite the worship team up. The reassuring words of Revelation echo through time. I am with you every day until the end, and then I'm coming back for you. I'm coming back for you. So here's the appeal, beloved. While our musicians sing this theme song, it was written by one of our pastors. We've been singing it for six weeks. The ushers are going to collect our tithes and our offerings, but I want you to, you, you, you need to return, or your connect cards, or whatever you need to put in there. But I need to make this appeal. Listen, please, very carefully. 
young or old, on the floor here or in the balcony, if you need to make a decision for Jesus, if there is something in your life that you've been unfaithful with, and that he is calling you to a faithfulness, you just stand where you're at. At any point during this song, you just stand. But there might be someone here today, young or old, who needs to make a public decision for Jesus. Maybe even prepare for baptism. Or rebaptism. I'm going to stand right here. I'm inviting Pastor Mike to join me down here. We're just going to stand here together while we sing this song. And if you know you need to make that decision, you come join us. We'll pray with you. That will be that. But if you are making a, a decision for something in your life, you and Jesus, you can stand where you're at while we sing this song and we collect the tithes and offerings.
his judgment has come. Worship him who made the earth and sky. Come and drink freely the water of life. Wash your robes clean in the blood of the Lamb. Alpha and Omega be given and He who was and is and is to Jesus, who began the good work, the Alpha, he will finish it in us. Now I'd invite all of us to stand for the benediction. And he who testifies of these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we respond. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be in God's people. Amen.